today at the National Press Club, University of Melbourne Professor Michael Wesley and former Deputy Secretary of the Department of Immigration, Abel Rizvi. The pair will discuss the question, is Australia's great multicultural experiment over? Professor Michael Wesley and Abel Rizvi with today's address. Hello and welcome to the National Press Club of Australia and today's Westpac Address. My name is Julie Hare, I'm the Education Editor at the Australian Financial Review and a Director here at the Club. Our guests today are Professor Michael Wesley, Deputy Vice-Chancellor Global Cultural Culture and Engagement at the University of Melbourne, and Dr Abel Rizvi, an independent columnist and thinker. We're going to be speaking about migration. Uh, it has become one of the hot issues of 2024, with both the coalition and the government going head to head about who can cut numbers the fastest and perhaps put in to threat by our fourth largest export sector, um, international education. However, let me introduce our guest. Our first guest is Michael Wesley. He has the very fancy title, as I just said, of Deputy Vice-Chancellor Global Culture and Engagement at the University of Melbourne, which means international students are very much part of his remit. Prior to Melbourne, he spent some years at nearby ANU as a Professor of International Affairs and Dean of the College of Asia and the Pacific. He has a PhD in International Relations at the University of St Andrews, and during COVID he got bored and wrote a wonderful little book called Mind of the Nation on the State of Australian Universities, which I can highly recommend. Dr Abel Rizvi is an independent commentator on all things migration, and otherwise known as a thorn in the side of the government and the coalition. He was a former Deputy Secretary of the Department of Immigration and influential in changing Howard government policies towards adopting mass migration targets, in part to subdue the ageing of the Australian population. He's a late life PhD graduate, having obtained his doctorate from the University of Melbourne in 2020, congratulations. And from the number of times I've spoken to him while he's been teeing off, I can say he, with great assurance he's a mad keen golfer. Both of our guests today are both migrants, both migrants as children to Australia, so they have a very personal invested interest in the topic under, um, under debate today. For those watching at home, you can join the conversation on X, where our handle is at Press Club Ost, or you can use the hashtag NPC. Welcome, Professor Michael. Uh, Wesley and Abel Rizvi, each are going to speak for about 15 minutes and we'll start with Abel and then we'll speak to Michael, then we'll have a discussion on the sofa and then hand it over to journalists. Thank you. Thank you, Julie, and good afternoon, everyone. I want to focus on the topic of net migration, which sounds really, really nerdy, but it is extraordinarily important in the context of the forthcoming federal election. The blowout of net migration to over 564,000 in the 12 months to September 2023, especially during a major housing crisis, has raised concerns amongst many. The Albanese government, somewhat belatedly, is taking action to reduce long-term net migration to 235,000 per annum. In other words, more than cutting it in half. The opposition, who no doubt sees the upside of an election fought on immigration issues, has responded. In a radio, radio interview, Mr Dutton declared he wants to reduce net migration to 160,000 per annum. It now feels inevitable that net migration, for the very first time in Australia's history, will be a major focus of a federal election. I welcome this focus on managing net migration, but I'm nervous about how a political debate about net migration may become ugly. Net migration refers to the number of long-term arrivals, minus long-term departures, of both Australian citizens and non-citizens. With our level of natural population increase shrinking, Net migration is and will remain the major determinant of the size and shape of Australia's future population. A sensible level of net migration and a carefully managed migration program is fundamental to our economic prosperity. 
to filling skill gaps, to delivering essential services. It has consequences for social cohesion and touches nearly every area of public policy. That we should have a public conversation about a long-term net migration target, or better a range given the difficulties of actually hitting a net migration target, and its consequences for our collective future is in my view unarguable. But whether we can have that conversation calmly and rationally remains an open question. The danger with an election fought on immigration levels, as many past Australian politicians on both sides have recognised, is that it could degenerate into Trump-style name-calling and civil unrest, including at polling centres. Few Australian politicians would go so far as, to, as suggesting immigrants are, quote, poisoning the blood, or calling them vermin, or terrorists, or the many other disgraceful things Trump and other authoritarian world leaders have said about immigrants. But in the heat of an election battle, I fear anything becomes possible. Some, including the Australian Greens, may criticise any sort of debate on immigration levels as reflecting Australia's less worthy history, including the White Australia policy. But that too would be wrong. I migrated with my family to Australia in the dying days of the White Australia policy. When Robert Menzies was Prime Minister, and yes, there were legal exemptions available, so I did enter legally. <laughs> <coughs> I also worked for almost 20 years in the Department of Immigration. That may gave me a good understanding of the difference between the White Australia policy and well-managed migration in the national interest. The forthcoming immigration election debate will, unfortunately, centre around who was responsible for the blowout in net migration and the subsequent pressure it put on infrastructure, housing and service delivery. As is true with almost all political arguments, neither the Labor nor the coalition governments are without fault. The previous coalition government put in place a range of policy settings, such as unlimited work rights for students, fee-free visa applications and the special COVID visa without considering the repercussions. That was in addition to a visa policy mess under Peter Dutton that his successors, both in the coalition government and under Labor, have been trying to fix. Many Australians would be surprised at the extraordinary undermining of visa integrity that took place under Dutton, given his tough on border protection image. The abuse of the asylum system under Dutton, as identified in the Nixon report, will take years, if not more than a decade, to address. The combination of massive asylum and other backlogs, as well as poorly thought out visa policies, meant a blowout in net migration was highly likely. The blowout was clearly evident by late 2022, when every month in that year repeatedly set new records for offshore student visa applications. This was not just a post-COVID hangover, as the record monthly offshore student applications continued right through 2023. The Labor government, while making some much needed policy changes to fix the visa mess it inherited, has added new measures that further boosted net migration. Most importantly, it failed to act on booming net migration until mid-2023 and then only very timidly until late 2023. In the lead up to the May 2023 budget, Treasurer Jim Chalmers said net migration wasn't a government policy or a government target. It's not a floor or a ceiling. It's not something the government determines. Nothing to do with us, I suppose. Now, in one sense, the Treasurer was correct. No Australian government has previously tried to manage net migration. But that, that's not to say they can't or that they shouldn't. Because of the forthcoming election battle on different net migration levels, it is good that no future Australian government will again pretend that managing net migration and our country's population future is not their responsibility. Managing net migration is neither easy nor without consequences, both positive and negative. Leaving aside how either party arrived at their respective long-term net migration targets, 
These are now locked in for the next election. We have the Coalition's target of 160,000 per annum, starting from some unknown year, and Labor's long-term target of 235,000 per annum, starting from 26-27, with an interim target of 260,000 in 24-25. From a demographic perspective, the Coalition's target would mean slower population growth and a faster rate of population ageing. That would be in the context of the shrinking and rapidly ageing populations of our two major trading partners, China and Japan, as well as most of Europe. The rest of this century will be very different to the last century. Net migration of 160,000 per annum is below the 200,000 or so suggested by Professor Peter MacDonald about 10 years ago as ideal in terms of using immigration to slow the rate of population ageing and managing our transition to a more elderly society. That was at a time Australia's fertility rate was substantially higher than the current 1.6 births per woman. As recently as 2019, Josh Frydenberg assumed fertility of 1.9 births per woman. That is a very substantial difference. Professor MacDonald's prediction or suggestion of net migration of 200,000 per annum was at a time natural increase of our population was around 150,000 per annum. Natural increase is now just above 100,000 per annum and falling. Australian history tells us it's much easier to reduce net migration when the labour market is weak and harder when the labour market is strong. In 2014-15, with unemployment rising to over 6%, net migration fell to around 184,000. Not that far from the 160,000 the Coalition is proposing. For politicians looking to reduce net migration, weak labour markets are their friend. But assuming no government wants to intentionally preside over weak labour markets, the job of reducing net migration becomes more complex and more controversial. Over the past decade, overseas students have generally represented between 40% and 50% of net migration. Despite the contribution students make to export income and the skilled jobs many go on to fill, the Albanese government has inevitably prioritised reducing growth of overseas students in its efforts to reduce net migration. They're doing this through a mixture of thoughtful policy changes, but also a short-term strategy of ramping up refusal rates using subjective criteria. That's not sustainable. Recognising this may not be enough, the government also proposes to cap international student enrolments at each of the 1,400 registered providers from January 2025. This will effectively mean the government decides how many customers each business in the industry can have each year. If that sounds odd in a market economy, that's because it is. That's not the way industries and businesses are managed in a market economy. But if Labor's approach is unsustainable, the coalitions would be pure chaos. They are apparently proposing an overall student cap which would allow each provider to fight it out year by year before an annual cap is reached. Chaos would ensue before the cap is reached earlier and earlier each year because of the build-up of massive backlogs. Both approaches represent short-termism ahead of an election. Professor Peter Coldrake has made it clear that without the right incentives, the underfunded university sector has long been chasing tuition revenue from overseas students and sacrificing learning integrity in the process. What we need is a measured long-term approach where registered education providers in each sector compete on a level playing field for students who have a sufficiently strong academic record. To secure a student visa, the government should introduce a minimum university entrance exam score cutoff, as exists for most domestic students. That should be determined by government to limit the incentive for educational institutions to put tuition fee revenue above academic excellence. Some concession in the university exam cutoff may be needed for regional universities, but that should be limited. The university entrance exam score, adjusted as needed, 
should be the primary means of managing sustainable growth in the industry, not caps. A different approach would be needed for the vet sector. Ideally, policy should assist temporary entrants who are already in Australia, such as Pacific Island farm labourers, to develop relevant trade skills that become a pathway to permanent residence and citizenship, not long-term immigration limbo. Post-study work rights should only be available to students who have studied in an area of long-term skill shortage or completed a postgraduate research degree. This would help reduce the 200,000 plus temporary graduates currently in Australia looking for a, a pathway to permanent migration while it will also help address major skill shortages. It is good that the Labor government has acted strongly to address the issue of dodgy colleges and a range of other practices that undermine the integrity of the student and visa visa system. That should have happened well before COVID. However, there are also a number of other visa initiatives coming on stream in 24-25 that will put upwards pressure on net migration. There is an assumption amongst some that because departures will rise over the next few years, everything will just fix itself. While departures will rise, everything won't just fix itself. Over the last decade, governments have added so many visa initiatives that the underlying level of net migration in a normal labour market is likely to be well north of 300,000. That means labour will have to do even more to get net migration down to its long-term target of 235,000. I suspect the next area of focus will be working holiday maker program, which is also growing strongly due to changes made over the past 10 years. Mr Dutton has said he will cut the number of visas issued under the migration and humanitarian programs to help deliver net migration of 160,000 per annum. He will need to cut the visas in the skill stream, but apart from construction trades, he has not indicated which skills he would prioritise and which would be cut. The smaller migration program would require virtual abolition of the parent category. Dutton will avoid mentioning this for fear of angering migrant communities. But cutting the permanent migration program will only make a minor contribution to reducing net migration. That is because the bulk of these visas go to people who are already in Australia on temporary visas. Apart from that, few details have been provided by the Coalition on how net migration of 160,000 per annum will be achieved and by when. We know that Nationals leader David Littleproud has said visas that help regional Australia are off limits. Littleproud also wants his agriculture visa resurrected. That would turbocharge net migration and migrant worker exploitation. I can't see how Dutton can agree to that. Peter Dutton wants more visas for construction trades. That is fine, but we have no details on how the coalition will attract more visa applications from qualified tradies who meet Australia's strict skills recognition and English language requirements. It is likely the coalition may say it will cut even more deeply into overseas student numbers, as that is the only option Dutton feels comfortable revealing before the election. That would mean even more job losses in Australia's universities. Net migration cannot be managed in the same way governments manage the migration program. Hitting a specific number of permanent visas issued is well within the capacity of government. That is not the case for net migration, given the measurement issues and the lags involved. The approach to managing net migration will have to be similar to the way the Reserve Bank manages inflation. That is to try to, and keep net migration within a broad range and to take early corrective action if it appears net migration is moving significantly outside the range that al after allowing for the impact of fluctuations in the labour market. In addition, both major parties will have to adopt a much higher level of discipline in developing new visa initiatives. There is a tendency for prime ministers and ministers, particularly when travelling overseas, to want to announce new visa initiatives with gay abandon. That is often with the strong support of DFAT, who bask in the glory of new visas and leave it to home affairs to manage the consequences. For example, Scott Morrison, while visiting England, announced major changes to the working holidaymaker agreement with the UK, with absolutely no regard for the impact on net migration. 
As a result, working holiday makers from the UK have boomed over the past two years and contributed significantly to net migration. Anthony Albanese, when visiting India, agreed to a new visa initiative for young Indians that will start in 24-25. Once again, no regard for the impact on net migration. Over the last decade, governments have added layer upon layer of these initiatives. That now means the underlying level of net migration is well above the targets the two parties have set. If governments are going to properly manage net migration, they need to apply discipline to new visa initiatives, similar to that for new spending initiatives. Just as ministers cannot announce new spending initiatives outside their budget, ministers shouldn't be allowed to announce new visa initiatives unless they can explain how these are consistent with the government's net migration target. I understand that in recent months, all major government decisions in the immigration space now contain modelling on the net migration Im impact. That is an excellent development and should be formalised for the long term. Thank you. Let me uh, begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respect to their ancestors and elders and any Indigenous colleagues with us today. In our national conversation, such as it is, about international students in Australia, there is a yawning silence uh, about the contribution that international education has made to the making of modern Australia. International students began studying at Australian universities in growing numbers in the 1950s, some of them courtesy of Colombo Plan scholarships. These students, mainly from Southeast Asia and South Asia, came to a country that was enforcing a racially exclusionary immigration program known as the White Australia Policy. It was a policy with bipartisan backing and broad public support. Many Colombo Plan students stayed with Australian families and began to have a significant effect on, shifting, on the shifting of society's attitudes to race. By the late 1950s, there was growing criticism of the white Australia policy. It started to be loosened in the mid-60s and was abandoned after 1973. International education also gave post-war Australia an unprecedented opportunity to shape the governments, societies and economies of its neighbours. The people who studied at our universities from our region returned to become the leaders, the public servants, the business people who shaped post-colonial societies in Asia and the Pacific. The stability development and openness of Australia's neighbours has been an incalculable strategic asset. We should not underestimate the role of Australia's alumni in this achievement or their role in ensuring Australia is welcomed as a close and trusted partner in the region. In the late 1980s, the government's response to the Jackson Review on Australian Aid led to a step change in international education in this country. Australia's universities were permitted to admit larger numbers of international students, provided they were paying for the full costs of their education and there was no taxpayer subsidy uh, involved. These changes coincided with the Dawkins reforms of higher education, which dramatically increased access to university for Australian students while managing the cost to the taxpayer by instituting deferred payment student loans known as HECS. The result was to turbocharge the development of a highly educated workforce that drove Australia's economic transformation and productivity surge over a three decade period from the early 1990s. Underpinning the expansion of access was the transformation of Australia's universities themselves, creating a system of global research powerhouses. 
This was no less crucial than our highly educated workforce in driving Australia's economic and social transformation in the decades straddling the millennium. Our research capability as a nation, along with our highly educated workforce, is crucial to our success in a world of rapid economic, technological, social and geopolitical change and disruption. These are assets that were vital to our response to the global pandemic. These are assets that underpin our ability to respond to climate change. These are assets that will enable our transition to an advanced economy of the future. Without a strong university sector, Australia will be less able to be a maker of its own luck. We will have to be a taker of the technology, knowledge, innovation and capability that others will allow us to have. It was our success at international education that allowed Australian universities to educate more and more Australians and become research powerhouses at a limited cost to the taxpayer and without saddling Australian students with American scale student debt. International students bring global perspectives and diversity to our classrooms and campuses. While subsidising the classrooms, labs, libraries and sporting facilities that Australian students use. They also contribute over a quarter of our investment in our research capabilities, according to modelling done by ANU's Andrew Norton. In short, international education has helped build the nation we are today, and it is crucial to our national future. That's why our whole community needs to be concerned about the government's proposed legislation that will allow it to arbitrarily impose caps on the number of student visas it issues in any given year. It is hard not to view this as a solution looking for a problem to solve. Some say it's part of a strategy of bringing down Australia's migration numbers. But 84% of international students who study at Australian universities go home after they finish their degrees. Only 16, 16% stay on in Australia. Surely controlling the number of international graduates that become long-term migrants could be better managed by a more tightly administered post-study work visa regime. Another justification for the proposed legislation is students' pressure on accommodation and thus their contribution to the housing crisis. But students comprise just 4% of renters in Australia. Melbourne, the, the nation's largest international student city, saw the number of student rooms increase by two and a half times in the last five years from 11,399 beds to 25,711 beds, and with another 3,700 in the construction pipeline. The student accommodation market in Melbourne is in equilibrium between de demand and supply. The impact of international students on broader accommodation availability is negligible. Another justification that is offered is international students' contribution to the cost, to cost of living pressures. I would instead direct attention to their contribution to keeping the Australian economy out of recession. Analysis by the National Australia Bank shows that spending by international students was responsible for over half of Australia's economic growth in 2023. Australian Bureau of Statistics data shows that Australia's anemic economic growth in the first quarter of 2024 is due to a fall in services exports, coinciding with the government's drastic slowing of visa processing for our, for our largest services export, international education. A final explanation, the government's own, is that this is about quote unquote managed growth in international education. 
The argument is that rapid growth in international student numbers, as happened in 2008, 2009, and 2022-2023 puts pressure on the migration system and undermines social licence for migration. It seems to me that an instrument allowing close government regulation of international student numbers is a big overreach in addressing an historically rare and short-lived problem. Recently, the Treasury Secretary observed that the uptick in student visas was temporary and has peaked. Already student visas uh, are at 34% below where they were this time last year. When governments propose new regulations, they should always have to answer for the opportunity costs and unintended consequences incurred by the changes. In seeking to impose a system-wide solution, the government risks further inattention to the real problem. Low-cost private providers that offer underqualified students a backdoor, a backdoor to the migration system. Existing regulatory frameworks already provide significant scope to address these long-standing issues. However, to date, these rules have not been adequately enforced due to a lack of coordination between agencies and inadequate resourcing for compliance activities. Beyond strict sanctions for non-compliance, the government should enact additional integrity measures, including requiring educational institutions to publish their first year retention and graduation rates by institution. It should also move to fix the Phoenix problem, whereby dodgy providers are closed down only to rise again with a different name and a different location. Another opportunity cost of this policy could be the long-term sustainability of the international education sector. Many universities have made substantial investments in developing more diverse international student cohorts in order to guard against sudden downturns in particular countries. We have already seen visa slowdowns and publicity about student visa caps depress demand in key diversification countries, thereby potentially reversing any progress made on diversification. In terms of unintended consequences, the one the government should be laser focused on is the potential for well-intentioned caps to develop into a sustained downturn in international student numbers. There is a very strong possibility that caps will reduce enrolments more than intended. I'm concerned that at many points in the development of this legislation, those drafting it have no idea about the dynamics of the international education uh, and international student recruitment. Already we are seeing students who had intended to study in Australia decide it's too risky. Why would they risk paying an application fee and a visa fee if there's a good chance they won't get a visa or have a long and uncertain wait? Why not just study in Europe or in the Gulf or in the US or in Singapore. The other trend that we're seeing is increasing unpredictability of student choices. This means that universities, threatened with punitive action for overshooting their caps, are likely to deliberately undershoot on, uh, on admissions to allay the risk of penalties. This will further depress numbers below intended levels. Sustained growth in international student numbers is the only lifeline for universities still trying to recover from the COVID lockdowns. Data shows that two thirds of Australia's universities are showing net operating losses every, every year since 2020. The previous government's job ready graduates package, which cut funding to courses in science and engineering by 16%, has meant that universities have been using other revenue to subsidise the education of Australian students in areas of vital national skills needs. Moreover, 
The huge expansion of university access for Australians, foreshadowed by Minister Clare's Universities Accord, has not been matched by any significant uh, commitment of extra funding to pay for the new classrooms, labs, lecturers and IT systems that will be required to educate all of these new people. In short, by restricting universities' ability to welcome international students, the government is in effect putting the burden of educating Australians either on higher student debt or on the taxpayer. Finally, we cannot ignore the unintended consequence of tipping the economy into recession. I've already covered the contribution of international students to keeping the economy buoyant in recent years. A sudden hit to, to the international education sector doesn't need elaborate modelling. It simply requires us to think back a few years. After the COVID restrictions lifted and before international students returned, small businesses struggled to find staff or sell products and services. The tourism sector went into freefall, desperate for staff and customers. We struggled to get fruit and vegetables to market. This could all happen again. And it's not just university jobs that will be lost. We know from those COVID years that lower numbers of international students means tens of thousands of jobs vanish in the broader economy. Some might say that if we see negative consequences for the economy, say, by the end of the year, the government could just increase the caps and the students will come back. It doesn't work that way. Trust, confidence and interest in Australia as a high quality higher education provider has been built up over decades. What the government is proposing is being interpreted as a major new source of sovereign risk that is spooking investors, credit ratings agencies and students and their parents. The choice of where to study is made over several years, not on the spur of the moment. Sudden changes in visa settings will not turn on the spigot of students again. Many of them will already be making long-term decisions to study elsewhere, as will their friends and siblings in years to come. It's worrying that the government has proposed such a potentially consequential regula regulatory regime with next to no consultation with the sector and no regulatory impact assessment. It's being debated in Parliament with universities still in the dark about the scale or the nature of the caps. The clear contrast here is with the university's foreign interference task force or UFIT process, a highly successful exercise between government and universities in mutual education, trust building and co-design of measures to counter foreign interference in universities. That sort of considered engagement, mutual acknowledgement of imperatives and expertise has been cons conspicuously absent in developing the regulations on international student numbers. Let me say in conclusion that international education is not a nice to have for Australia. International education underpins the viability, quality and competitiveness of Australia's university system, which in turn is central to our nation's success in a world of rapid economic, technological, social and geopolitical change and disruption. We should rightly be alarmed when governments seek to intervene in international education to solve ill-defined problems for which there are better solutions in the run-up to an election. Governments come and go. Lasting damage stays with the country for the long term. The consequences of ill-judged intervention into international education will be either higher student debt and a bigger bill for the taxpayer, or lower quality education and reduced access for Australian students. Not to mention Australia's sovereign ability to navigate a world of change and disruption on its own terms. Thank you.
Thank you both so much. Um, Abel, I will start with you. Um, you talk about, talk about the need to manage net migration. I want to understand first why there has been such reluctance over time to manage net migration and to set targets and how, if that does happen, how that would intersect with the caps on international students that, we're, that Mark has been talking about. There has been a long-term assumption in government that um, managing the permanent visas issued is sufficient to manage the wider uh, net migration measure. Um, for most of our history, well, certainly since World War II, that has been true. But if we are going to be increasingly living in a world where temporary migration, not just students, working holiday makers, skilled temporary entrants, a, a wide range of temporary visas are going to be the ones that are going to be growing steadily in an uncapped world where permanent migration is capped, you're going to run into trouble. And the reluctance of governments to manage net migration has been because of the difficulties of managing it. Permanent migration, you can hit the target bang on every year, easily done. You can't with net migration. Net migration is a much more difficult measure to manage because it involves the movement of people, not just non-citizens, but also citizens, and it is much harder to manage. But that is not an argument for not managing it. It'd be like saying, because inflation is hard to measure, let's not manage it. Well, no one's going to agree to that. In the same way, I think you have to manage net migration, albeit in a different way to how we manage permanent migration. Um, I think what's happened in the last 24 months means no future government will ever not accept responsibility for managing net migration. We have turned a corner. But isn't this a temporary effect of COVID that, you know, we, we know that the number of international students here at the moment is slightly less than it would have been on the trajectory pre-COVID. So is this going to normalise or is, this, is there just a post-COVID hunger for people to move and live overseas? Unfortunately, with most public policy problems, uh, what you've just said is partly true, but partly not true. Um, yes, departures will rise, but they will not rise sufficiently to get net migration to the level the government wants. Now, we can debate whether that's the right level or not, but they've now declared it, and so you just have to accept it. The layer on layer of visa initiatives that are in place, not just in the students' area, but in many other areas, means, in my view, net migration will decline, but I would be very surprised that without significant further measures, not just in the students' area, but in other areas, they won't get it down below 300,000. OK. Now, Michael, I need to ask you about international students. How many is too many? We know at the moment about one in every 26 people in Australia is either a current international student or a former international student. Um, I understand we've had problems with integrity and rorting of the visa system with lower quality providers, but at the same time, Melbourne University and Sydney University have half their, interna half their student cohorts, international students. Do you have an idea of how many is too many? Uh, look, I, I think what your question and um, Abul's presentation really raised is that a lot of this discussion about regulation and caps is being done in an analysis-free zone. You know, what really worries me is that uh, people are pulling numbers out of the air um, because they think that they will, they will look electorally attractive. Um, we haven't really done, as far as I'm aware of, all, the, the, the careful analysis of the sort that you quoted with Peter McDonald's numbers about what, what is it that we're trying to manage here? What are the, what are the, what are the elements that we're trying to move towards um, and, and start to build policy based on that? So I don't have a number, but we need to think about what are, what are the benefits of international students as well as what are the impacts of international students? We need to have a rational discussion and debate about that and come up with um, a, a consensus number, if you like. Um, but we haven't done that. We've dived straight in to putting our fingers in the wind and saying, I reckon this number looks okay. 
Um, so look, I, I, I think that needs to be done uh, comprehensively. I, I actually happen to think our own figures are not half, they're about 42%. I thought it was more 46, 47. Um, no, that's Sydney, sorry. No, 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 I did uh, see somewhere with Melbourne. I think um, it was an annual report, no, but anyway. I've got, I've you're, got you're Melbourne data. You're the boss data. of that department, so I'm I've sure you know. I've got Melbourne data. But, <laughs> um, uh, I, I actually happen to think that uh, we are educating for uh, people to work in a globalised world uh, and that the internationalisation of our curriculums, the international right, uh, internationalisation of our classrooms, of our campuses, are an essential part of education for all of our students, Australian students and international students. So I would support uh, relatively high numbers of international students for the benefit of everyone, for the, for the quality of the education we're able to provide. Okay. This is a question to both of you. and. I guess it's kind of a rhetorical question, but today Peter Dutton has announced not so much filling out the, the gaps in his nuclear policy, but basically announcing where it's going to be. And the first nuclear reactor, it seems, it will open in 2037. At the same time, all that nuclear building goes on as we, as if they get elected, we have AUKUS going ahead, which has already got people scratching their heads about skills. So if Peter Dutton's reduction in net migration, which will include involve a massive slashing of international students and skilled workers. How are we going to get to a nuclear energised Australia and have nuclear submarines? Um, I'll start with you, Abel. Um, yeah, a couple of things there. I, I, I don't think the aggregate number of students in Australia is going to fall. Under 235,000. I think there's a lot of hype around that, but if you did the, the arithmetic, it's not going to fall. It could fall at 160,000, but it wouldn't fall at 235. Right. No. Um, the second thing to say is, you're absolutely right, the filling of skills gap, especially with such urgent projects, is going to be difficult. Um, attracting the people who are going to help build nuclear submarines as well as nuclear um, um, power plants, we don't have. That's not an industry we've had. Um, other people have those sorts of industries. We're going to have to attract those skills. I doubt whether we can train the people up quickly enough in those areas, given the urgency involved. But there are other areas which I think are equally important, but perhaps not as sexy. And I would point to the health and aged care sector, where the ageing of our population will just keep ramping up the pressure on our hospitals. That is just going to be relentless. And we are never going to be able to train enough nurses and doctors to cope with the ageing of our population. I'll just, I'll just add to that. So Jason Clare's Australian Universities Accord report talks about more than doubling the number of students at Australian universities by 2050. Who's going to teach them? Who's going to teach them? We're, we're struggling already with the number of students to number of academic staff. So there, there seems to be this assumption that we can just sort of magic these solutions out of the air. It takes expertise, it takes training, it takes people to do this sort of thing. My, my worry about both sides of politics at the moment is that they're, they're dreaming. They're absolutely dreaming and they're not thinking through the consequences. I mean, if you take the combined um, cost of uh, AUKUS and the energy transition, and the, the future made in Australia, put all of that together, who's going to pay for that? Where's the tax base going to come from? Because the tax base is already dwindling. So, you know, governments have to start to get real and actually talk to the Australian public and educate the Australian public that really migration is a big part of Australia's future. Thank you. Our first question is from Andrew Tillett from the Australian Financial Review. Uh, thanks, Julia. It's Andrew from the Financial Review and also uh, Vice President here at the Press Club. Um, just picking up on a, a point you made there a moment ago, Abel, about hospitals. As someone who's uh, recently had a, a parent and a parent in law, both in the health system, um, and as someone who's got a, a young daughter in childcare, you sort of get an appreciation of just how much the care economy relies on migrants to, um, to, to tick over. Is this perhaps the, the dirty little secret of the Australian economy, though, that, that effectively um, 
these sectors are relying on on, on foreign workers to fill these um, shortages, and that if we do cut migration, Australian consumers and ultimately Australian taxpayers, because these sectors are also heavily subsidised by government, will have to face uh, higher prices and higher taxes to pay for effectively um, workers uh, onshore already here to, to, to fill those roles. I mean, are we effectively, is, it, is this the dirty secret that we're effectively relying on cheap foreign labour to keep our economy ticking over? Um, some parts of the economy, that's true. Um, certainly in, in areas such as um, farm agri agricultural labour, we do rely on cheap foreign labour to do that work. The bulk of the farm labour, the, the, the casual farm labour workforce in Australia are either from the Pacific or they're working holiday makers. So obviously those areas will need to be thought about very carefully and I suspect in the process of the coalition working out what to cut, Mr Littleproud will push back pretty hard on anything that hurts farming, the farming sector. Um, the care economy, you're right, is absolutely reliant on foreign labour. I wouldn't call it cheap labour. I, I, think, I think nurses are... Uh, highly skilled. Maybe some of those doctors' fees as well as perhaps. Yes, the doctors are also <laughs> highly skilled. <laughs> are also highly skilled. And if you looked carefully at last year's migration program outcome, mm. you would see health and aged care workers, particularly nurses, doctors and aged care workers, who are by far the dominant sector from, for which we filled places. So if we're going to start to cut, you have to work out what it is you're going to cut. And I cannot imagine uh, Mr Littleproud agreeing to cutting areas that help, the regional, help regional Australia, and I cannot imagine Mr Dutton agreeing to cut nurses and doctors, given the waiting times in many of our hospitals. So where are you going to cut, especially as Mr Dutton is saying he wants more tradies and presumably he wants more people to build nuclear reactors? Well, is this, is this a sort of reverse magic pudding, effectively? <laughs> We're talking about here that, you know, well, if we start quarantining certain sectors, I mean, as you say, where do the... <coughs> come? It, it becomes extraordinarily difficult. And that's why I suspect um, we won't be told what will be cut. Because it's... It, uh, the moment you start identifying what will be cut, it looks horrible. Thank you. Uh, Michael, I have a question for you from John Ross from Times Higher Education, who couldn't be with us today. But he says, have universities made a mistake in not adequately considering the need for infrastructure, particularly student housing, as they increase their international intakes to the equivalent of almost 2% of the Australian population? Uh, was it naive to imagine that they could be given carte blanche to keep recruiting more foreign students? So I think there's a very elegant market solution that's sprung up to the question of accommodation and that is highly efficient purpose-built student accommodation providers. Mm. Um, you know, within looking distance of my apartment in Melbourne, uh, all through COVID, there were cranes building high-rise student accommodation. They're all high-rise student accommodation. As I said, in the years since 20, 2019, Student accommodation in, in Melbourne has increased two and a half times. So that's, that's a market-led solution to this question. And I'll tell you what one of the effects of, of, what's, of, of, of the signalling of these visa caps has had. The student accommodation providers are saying that investors are running for the exits. Mm. So the effect of this policy will be to to create a grinding halt to an elegant market solution to this. The other thing I would say to John's question is if you get universities in, into the business of building large-scale student infrastructure, and universities are big businesses, they're, they're big entities economically, uh, it's going to, it, it, we're already struggling to build enough accommodation for, for Australians at the moment. It's going to draw workers away from there, it's going to draw materials away from there, it's going to draw uh, investment and land away from the building of, of, of accommodation for Australians. 
So again, you know, this kind of ill thought through policy that has these completely um, unintended consequences that really go against the, the purpose of, of what the policy might be for in the first place. Mm. I've got to say that on that, though, the number of times I've heard over the years, you know, ed federal education ministers, you know, kind of put out punitive measures if universities don't do this or don't do that. I've never actually seen it <laughs> <laughs> actually happen. <laughs> uh, uh, next question is from Nick Stewart. Uh, Abul, thank, thank, thanks very much for this. I mean, isn't the reality just that Australia is addicted, completely addicted to a, a, a growth, growth in the immigration uh, stream? We, we, you know, Kevin Rudd said we imagined a cap of 37 million and there was fury at this because obviously although the number of people are getting larger, Sydney Harbour isn't getting any larger, so you're not getting any closer to getting a spot on Sydney Harbour. Um, isn't the problem that really the politicians won't actually face the reality that at some point or another, we've got to get off this escalator that just goes on assuming that there's going to be more growth? and just so that the uh, university sector doesn't get out of this. I, I mean, Sydney University, to take a, another example, has closed International House at the moment, which is a, 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 a college which was actually established to, uh, through individual donations to, rather than the university itself, to support international students. Shouldn't places like universities actually accept particularly high quality universities like Melbourne and Sydney, um, accept the responsibility to accommodate far more of their university foreign students so that they're actually providing much better engagement and time here in Australia. Did you want to go? Um, the, the, the population question is always a difficult one. I, I, um, I'd say and, and, and there is an enormous amount of merit in, in government looking at the population issue over the long term, um, taking the Australian public into its confidence in what its plan is in that respect. I think the important thing to remember with population is it has so many dimensions to it that it's, that it's probably wrong if you look through it through one lens only, you'll probably get the wrong answer. You're going to have to look at it through multiple lenses and that becomes really hard. In my experience, the vast majority of people look at population through a single lens, whatever their favourite lens is, and, and that, there's a multitude of lenses you can look at. at a place it on Sydney Harbour. <laughs> you, a place on Sydney Harbour may be the lens um, 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 or, or, or a, a range of other issues, such as, such as uh, the amount of time you're prepared to wait in a hospital um, to, 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 to get a bed because there aren't enough staff. Where do we stop on that one? Um, the, the, the important thing to note on population is that the rest of this century will see population growth globally continue to slow and slow and slow. Later this year, the UN will put out its next set of projections for the global population. Its previous set said the world's population would peak by 2080 at around 10 billion. I think the next one will have an earlier peak with a lower number. China is already well past its peak. Japan is well past its peak. Most of Europe is well past its peak. Despite the carry on about, oh, we're being flooded, uh, it, Europe is actually shrinking in population terms. Do we need to begin preparing now for this shrinking? Should Absolutely. we stop in... Uh, our immigration so that we actually start getting slow immigration, so we start getting ready for the new situation? I think there's a balance there. Um, the faster you slow, the more aged you become. So there's a trade-off. Um, if you're happy to wait a couple of years for a hospital bed, you know, that's the trade-off you accept. I don't know many of us are prepared to wait two, three years for a hospital bed. Our next question is from Reuben Halcrow from Canberra Grammar School. 
Hi, my name is Ruben Halcrow and I'm here with uh, Canberra Grammar School and I'll address this question to the both of you. Um, in what ways do, you, do our immigration policies impact the brain and labour drain of countries also struggling with population growth and labour shortages and thus how does this impact our international relations with those affected countries? Probably one better for you, isn't it, isn't well, it Michael? Let, let me say um, a big shout out to Canberra Grammar School. Uh, both of my sons are graduates of Canberra, Canberra, Canberra Grammar School, so great to see you all here. Look, um, I, I actually think that if I'm to stay on safe ground here, international education, we've done a lot uh, to facilitate the brain gain of many countries around the world. The University of Melbourne welcomes students from 150 countries to be educated on our campuses. And uh, when, you, when I travel internationally, which is quite a bit, and I meet our alumni, I'm absolutely astounded at, at just the, 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 the wonderful quality of these people uh, and, and, and the, incredible, the incredible accomplishments uh, that they've had. So I think that we need to think about it not so much as a, drain, a brain drain, but a, a brain circulation, a talent circulation. I think we should all celebrate the fact that Australia is a magnet for talent and aspiration uh, because we are the most successful international educator in the world um, and, uh, and the fact is that we enrich other societies through our education just as people from other societies enrich Australia by choosing to come and live here. Thank you. Our final question is from Emeritus Professor Sharon Bell. Um, thank you very much for such a thoughtful and thought-provoking discussion. These are big issues around complex ecosystems, higher education and its intersection with migration. They're not simple issues. But uh, one of the things that I noticed in the discussion is that we all, and it reflects the policy environment as well, constantly slip back to that interface between education and skills and skill shortages in Australia. Yeah. The previous questioner raised the important question as what, is the, what are the implications of that elsewhere? And it does seem to me to pick up on Dr Rizvi's point, the danger of discussion of our changes to uh, migration are critical. But the danger, I think, or I would ask, who does that rest with? Does it rest with the political rhetoric? Does it rest with the media? Or does it in fact rest primarily with our international students and the quality of their experience, the quality of the international student experience? Because that in fact is what is going to inform the decisions, the next generation of students. And it is another factor that we actually have very little control over. What can we be doing in that space because we're not talking about the quality of that student experience and, as Michael said, the contribution of those students at the moment. Okay. Uh, thanks, Sharon. Um, look, I, I agree with you. I think that we could be doing more. I think generally uh, in, in Australia, universities should be doing more to enhance the, the experience of all students. One of the things that uh, I've been working on with colleagues at the University of Melbourne is, is how to um, uh, facilitate uh, greater social mixing between Australian students and international students. I think that's to the enormous benefits of both uh, and it happens all too little. I think one of the challenges is that so many of our universities are commuter universities. Uh, people tend to come to, you, to campus for classes and then leave straight, straight away. So I think one of the things that we've, we've lost and we need to rebuild is that our campuses should be places of social mixing, intellectual ferment uh, and, uh, and intercultural interaction. So I think that, that needs to be a, a big agenda that we take forward. Okay. Thank you both very much. Before we give you a round of applause, I'd like to give you both a life membership to the National Press Club. So next time you're in town, pop in Thank for you a beer. Fantastic. And Thank please you. join me oh. in thanking our guests. Oh, sorry, one more. Thank you.